For anyone who's lived in Southern California for any length of time, you know that wildfires are just part of the lifestyle around here. That in the fall, when the Santa Ana winds blow, fires are often quick to follow. But in recent years, things seem to have gotten much worse. Wildfires are bigger, badder, and last longer. Is this the new normal? Are droughts going to leave us vulnerable to year-round fire seasons? Will there be new restrictions on building in fire-prone areas? And what of firefighting? Will new tools and techniques be able to help? Fox 11 News In Depth starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Hal Eisner. We've just come out of a couple of weeks of nightmarish fires where residents in many parts of our community had to flee from the terror of encroaching flames. Winds up to gale force have blown embers from those fires for long distances, catching parched brush on fire and starting new blazes. And firefighters stretched thin by fighting weeks and months of these fires in all corners of our state, find themselves overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the disasters. It always starts with the winds. One spark blown by the Santa Anas can become a raging wildfire in just moments. Our own Bob DeCastro can attest to that. The winds are so strong, and mind you, we're not even in those mountainous areas where gusts could reach up to 80 miles per hour. But California's notorious wildfires are built on more than just those devil winds, dry brush, sparking power lines, illegal bonfires, arson, all contributing factors. But despite the terrifying rash of recent blazes, this fire season has actually been less destructive than the past two. Part of that is pure luck, but it can also be attributed to changes in strategy. $1 billion was put in additional resources for new fire suppression equipment, uh, new pre-positioning. We have additional firefighters on duty today, strategically placed throughout the city in the brush areas. Firefighters relying on pre-positioning of resources in fire-prone areas, plus utilizing firefighting tactics and equipment from the very high tech to knock down those fires fast to the very low tech for brush clearance and high-risk terrain. A new hotly debated tactic by PG&E and Southern California Edison was intended to stem the start of wildfires by shutting down power lines when the winds grow fierce. This is going to happen every time we get some high winds. We're going to shut power down to everybody. But it was not 100% successful by any means. With up to five wildfires, including the Kincaid fire that ravaged Sonoma County, attributed to power lines and transformers. And then, of course, things turned political, with President Trump attacking Governor Newsom in a tweet, blaming him for bad forest management, even though the recent fires haven't been in the forest. And the majority of forests in California are managed by the federal government. The governor tweeting back his response, you don't believe in climate change, you are excused from this conversation. So what is California going to do? Looking forward to even more of these disasters in the future. The fire season is lengthening by several weeks each year, probably associated with gradual climate change. So the question we're asking today is this. Are these brush fires the new normal? Joining us to discuss are L.A. City Fire Captain Cody Wireeder, L.A. County Fire Captain Tony Brenda, Ventura County Fire Captain Tony McHale, and Cal Fire Battalion Chief Lucas Spellman. And gentlemen, let's start with Chief Spellman because... We've talked about this, this new normal. What do you think about that? Well, things have changed. When we started in our careers in the beginning, we had uh, training that we had, and things have uh, definitely changed in a different manner that we have to pay attention more so to what we're doing, our tactics, how we're going about those things. So it really is something different in the 25 years that I've been on, and we can't deny the fact that we are dealing with different fires these days. Cody, we talk about climate change and the influence on California. Is that what we're dealing with here, do you think? There's a lot of different factors that go into these things. Um, our main focus is we have we have scientists to look into this. We have police officers to do their job. Our main focus is keeping the citizens safe through our fire protection. Matt McHale, Captain McHale, you just had this bad fire in Ventura County. That's it correct. was it was up in the Santa Paula area, and and it it, it was rough, and it, it may have been started by re-energizing re of a power line. How, how much of an issue is this as far as concerns for firefighters? In terms of uh, the power. And, and this seems to be an ongoing issue. 
Yeah, you know, uh, the cause of this, uh, of the Maria fire that you're referring to in the Santa Maria Paula fire. is currently under investigation. Uh, you know, in the past, I've been on the job for 20 years, and I have seen uh, a number of fires where the cause was determined to be related to electrical equipment, malfunctioning electrical equipment. Uh, it is something that we have to consider, and we do know that they're trying a new approach with these public safety power shutoffs. And, Does know, it help? Well, you know, I think right now the jury is still out. I think there, there may be some unintended consequences that they have to weigh. So I'll leave that to the policymakers to decide whether or not it's effective. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the cause of the Maria fire is officially under investigation. Tony and Brenda, how do, how do we deal with this quote unquote new normal? Well, I, you know, I think we have to take into consideration that there are a lot more people um, and a lot more assets at risk in the wildland urban interface. And we have to, you know, continually to evaluate the situation and, and you know, augment our staffing and our equipment and our tactics to meet that, that threat. We have so many more structures and folks living in the area where brush fires start. You know, it's critical for us to be able to evaluate what's at risk and how to be able to uh, augment our staffing to, to meet that threat. And Lucas, you guys have to deal with this statewide and what's happened up in Sonoma County and, and the five or six fires we've had down here. It, it, it's got to be very difficult. Well, you know, CAL FIRE usually lends a, a hand to most departments throughout the state. So we're involved in almost every single wildland fire uh, that has gone on in the last uh, week or two. And we had 212 fires just over the last week that we were at. And so 212, 212. And we can be up to 350, 400 on really busy weeks. So you can only imagine how much the fire departments throughout the state are working together to make sure and put these fires out. And only 5% do you actually even see because they're over 10 acres. We're looking at, at video here where the, the flames are just just gnarly. I mean, they're just whipping up all over the place. That's got to be hard when you're on the front line, right, Tony? Absolutely. I mean, anytime you have heavy fuels burning with wind on it, you've got a lot of radiant heat. It's hard to get close to that type of fire. Uh, it's dangerous to our firefighters. And of course, our aircraft are not as, as effective with that type of radiant heat. It's, it's not, it, the radiant heat is really a, a very key point here. I, I, Tony McHale, uh, a few years ago, more than a few years ago, Orange County Fire Authority invited me to, to put on some of the, the Nomex gear and, and to go start backfires with them in plus 100 degree heat. It was very hot. And the idea was to see what it's like for a firefighter who's dealing with these incredible temperatures to also deal with the radiant heat. I, I got to tell you, I dehydrated like that. I couldn't believe how fast the water was escaping my body. You guys have to deal with that all the time. You know, one thing about firefighters, it's a very, very motivated, dedicated bunch. This is what we train to do. This is what we do. So, of course, we're, we do everything we can to prepare and train, learn new things, adapt and overcome is the motto. But you're right. Uh, we're, we're all all-risk firefighters here. We do everything. Structures, medical calls, traffic collisions. But I would have to say in my career, some of the most dangerous situations that I've ever been in is doing structure protection on wind-driven fast moving fires. That's because it might be coming your way? The conditions. Everything we do is based on conditions and some of these conditions extreme fire behavior and yes it, it is the ultimate challenge and uh, you know for me to say you know courage is not the absence of fear but training kicks in and not only that just the sheer fortitude that firefighters have men and women on the line boots on the ground getting the job done. Courage is not the absence of fear but it takes a lot of courage no matter what you say. That's to right. get out there and fight those very, very intense flames. And the training for that is, it, it, just give us a quick idea of what the training is like for dealing with these sort of fires, Lucas. So we start off, uh, they have to have actually a, an academy before they even can come put in an application for us. Then once they've done that at the college level, they come to us and we put them through another academy. And then if you're lucky enough and fortunate enough to drive a fire engine, you have to go through another academy and that goes on throughout our careers. And I'm probably speaking for everyone that is standing here, it, there's never a day that we don't practice and train on the skills that we do in our job. Except for the days that you're fighting those fires. Absolutely, and that's on the job training. That is and on the so job training, it, isn't uh, it, right? Yeah, yeah, there's never a day that I don't think to myself I haven't learned something in this job. Yeah, and, and I can say that about my job, too. There's never a day that goes by that I don't learn something about my job as well, and your jobs as well. Coming up next on Fox 11 News In Depth, we're going to talk about a couple of really interesting things. First, new tools to help fires, uh, fight fires in California, but also the weather and, and how fire departments deal with that internally. We'll be right back. Um.
Joining us now are LA County Fire Battalion Chief Andrew Smith and Cal Fire Southern Regional Chief Dan Johnson. And really good of both of you to be here because you've got some very important news to break here, as I understand it. Cal Fire has just purchased some new equipment that could be a big help in fighting these fires. Why don't you tell us about that? And we'll look at some pictures as you're doing that. First, uh, let's bring up one of those pictures and have you talk about what that particular craft is right there. Sure, these are our new SI-60 Firehawk or Blackhawk helicopters, uh, specifically built for wildland firefighting. Uh, they're one of the only ones built specifically for that application. We're getting 12 of them and they're about $24 million a piece. Holy cow, 24 million and you're yes. getting how many? 12. 12 of them. And what will these do? Do they have hoses coming out of them? or how They, do they have work? a fixed tank underneath uh, that will have over 1,000 gallons of water and be able to do controlled water drops. Uh, they're a much faster helicopter than our aging Vietnam era 205 uh, Hueys. Uh, so these are going to be very effective in the wildland environment. They also have hoisting capabilities. Uh, their air speeds, capacities, elevations that they can fly with the larger capacity of water are very, very uh, important for us. Let's bring the, the image back to you for a second because I wanted to just ask you as a guy who's been around for a long time, how do you feel about these particular aircraft that you're going to be bringing on board? Incredible. Uh, this is a uh, this is two steps above what we got on Vietnam era helicopters. Uh, those have been very very effective for us for many years, but these machines are much faster, much more efficient. Now this one this one is is also new. And tell me about this. This is a C-130 Hercules, uh, and these we're going to have fixed tanks in them that will be able to do controlled drops of over 4,000 gallons of retardant. Now, we, we, when we think about the retardant, we think about those DC-10s. Mm -hmm. uh, how will this differ from that? So what is interesting about these uh, tankers is that will be owned by CAL FIRE. So we will have them year-round. They'll be staged throughout the state, and they'll be immediately available for dispatch. So unlike Super Scoopers and Ericsson Sky Cranes that you lease or rent, you know, depending on the department, uh, these will be owned. That's correct. And, and so let me ask you, why is it that, that we do leasing? Why do we rent things instead of owning them? Well, with the leasing of different aircraft, we look for the application. So we lease our fixed wing fleet, which are the super scoopers, and we look seasonally to when we're going to lease those for the And there's cost. No, no value in owning those? Well, we need multi-mission aircraft uh, for the municipal organizations. Um, so cost-effective wise, it's uh, better to lease and then they can travel around the world as fire season travels around the world. But so we use those for a specific mission for fire season. I want to ask you about weather because that's really your niche, right? Is, is sort of letting the troops know what you're learning weather wise. Are you a meteorologist? No, I'm a fire behavior analyst. So I interpret the weather that the National Weather Service provides us and I use that application, how it's going to affect the fire and advancing fire front and tactics. Well, how have you dealt with these past couple of weeks where we've had fire after fire after fire and all of them seemingly wind driven? Um, it's been busy, but we have a um, very unified approach with the Weather Service and our cooperators. So we look at the relative risk every day. We look where our vulnerabilities are. We staff appropriately, and we also reach out to our cooperating agencies for assistance if we need it. L.A. County is also bringing on board some new equipment. Tell us about that. That's correct. We're bringing on two additional Blackhawks to augment our fleet. So we'll have a total of five, and that should be coming on here by the end of the year and into the, uh, the spring of next year. Now, when you bring those on, is that to replace older models, or is that, that to is add Replace. It's going to add, and it's also going to replace uh, some of our 412 aircraft we have. So we'll have a total of five of what is called the Firehawk. You know, I know that every aspect of firefighting is important. I know that the ground crews, the, the bulldozers, everything is important. But it seems to me that the aerial attack is always sort of the thing that makes a difference. Would you agree? Sure, sure. You know, that uh, aerial attack... Uh, uh, allows the troops on the ground just to hold that fire a little bit so we can follow up with those other resources. So when you the get ground. these new these new birds, these new aircraft, how's that going to make it better? Uh, having them immediately available to us in large quantities. Uh, we spend a lot of money in the state and federal partners to keep aircraft in California. And what's interesting is that this is actually the time of year a lot of these contractors are packaging up and heading to Australia for their fire season. Australia. So sometimes it's a struggle to keep them in California for that time. So our year-round seasonal firefighting efforts now are, are requiring us to have stuff that's year-round availability. You know, I got to tell you a personal story, the Saddle Ridge Fire, when that was coming across Porter Ranch, and I live in Simi Valley, so it was coming right toward my house, and firefighters were able to keep it at the county line. But the reason I think they were able to keep it at the county line is because when day broke, yes. the aircraft came out and stopped that fire at the county line, or I might be without a home today. 
That's that, true. That's how scary there's some, that is. There's some truth in that. Yeah. So the the helicopters are able to protect structures and assist in that piece, but it's very short pieces and segments of the incident. And when we get the large aircraft flying, and we work with LA County and our federal partners have that aircraft up at sunlight, they're able to make those drops in a much bigger effort and. and help with those assisting, uh, controlling that front. There's line. another part of this that's, that's very critically important. We're going to talk about it in just a minute, and that's firefighter fatigue and how these firefighters are able to deal with the fire after fire after fire sort of scenario that we've been seeing. We'll be back right after this break. The fires we've been having statewide have been going on for weeks. Needless to say, firefighters have been run ragged. How are these fire departments keeping their first responders fresh, awake, and importantly, alert? Back with us are all of our fire officials, LA City Fires Captain, Fire Captain Cody Wireader, LA County Fire Captain Tony and Brenda, Ventura County Fire Captain Tony McHale, CAL FIRE BATTALION CHIEF LUCAS SPELLMAN, LA COUNTY BATTALION CHIEF ANDREW SMITH, AND CAL FIRE SOUTHERN REGIONAL CHIEF DAN JOHNSON. AND BOY, TALK ABOUT A HALL OF FAME RIGHT THERE. THAT'S A WHO'S WHO OF FIREFIGHTERS IF I EVER HEARD ONE. <laughs> FIREFIGHTER FATIGUE. YOU GO THROUGH FIRE AFTER FIRE. WHAT WE JUST WENT THROUGH WERE, WHAT, FIVE FIRES, uh, STARTING WITH SADDLE RIDGE, RIGHT? Uh, HOW DO YOU GET THROUGH THAT? HOW TIRED ARE OUR FIREFIGHTERS? AND HOW ARE YOU DEALING WITH THESE SORT OF SITUATIONS? Let's start with McHale and Ventura County. Over my years, 20 years, that there's no question about it. We get thrown against the ropes hard, and fatigue is a factor. We have to fall back on our, on our training. We have to fall back on pure fortitude. Usually the initial attack is the toughest time. That's when we're really up against it. But in time, as the, man, as the incident gets managed, management teams get in there, they start to rotate crews. So what I do is I lean into the task at hand. My crews do the same thing until we get relieved. But again, it's just a total dedication. So the, to the other Tony now and Brenda, uh, do they go out there for like 24 hours and, and do a hard job and then they get replaced by fresh troops? How does that work? Well, it, like Captain McHale was saying, during initial attack, that's when we're really experiencing the most fatigue and during that phase that's when when the situation is most critical so the firefighters that are on duty respond immediately to the fire they go to work and they keep working until we get relief in and fortunately a lot of our mutual aid partners around the state start pouring resources into the area and they are able to start augmenting our staff and being able to we can start pulling people off the line and we can put uh, fresh personnel out there to, to keep the job rolling 24 hours a day. I know how tired I get covering these fires, so you must, Cody, you must sometimes get really beat. True, and I think it starts really before the fire happens, uh, really highlighting our, our wellness program and, and our firefighters taking care of themselves and, and, and the exercise and training really comes into play when we have that 12-hour operational period where it's nonstop. So, so is that right? 12 hours, Lucas? 12 hours nonstop and then you get replaced? Well, we initial attack can be a day and a half, two days oh, really? if necessary. Um, we work on a 24 on, 24 off. Uh, but for firefighters in general, I think uh, our mindset is, is that people are depending on us. We have a job to do and uh, we just put our heads down and, and uh, just go after it as hard as we can for as long as we can to see if we can take care of the people that we serve. We hear about mutual aid all the time and mutual aid is basically when another community fire department comes in to help and all of these fires we've had have involved mutual aid. So that's a big part of this <clears throat> replacing troops, right? Yes, once we get into the operational tempo, if you will, after we get an incident management team in place, we have an operations section, a planning section, and we have this machine moving to combat this fire is when we can get into 24-hour shifts, we can get into 12-hour shifts, and each type of area of the fire may be under a different type of shift component based upon the need for that geographic piece of uh, real estate, if you will. Now, for a lot of people, and what you're looking at right now is a base camp. For a lot of people, uh, they may not know what a base camp is, but I certainly do because I've, I've spent plenty of time around base camps over the years. This is, this is your, this is, if you're camping out, this is your base camp. This is where you rest. This is where you eat. Uh, it's a big operation to have a base camp, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I want to take it back to what uh, Cody was saying, is that on a normal day-to-day -day business, 
when we ramp up to these weather events, guys are out there and gals just working their tails off to keep up the pace. And then we have one of these fires that actually breaks off and takes out. It's a whole another step into a 24 or 48 hour event for them to get into the mode of base camp logistics being able to be established for them. We do a good job and do that within 24 hours. We'll have literally a city there. But in, in my respect as the region chief now, I have everything from Sacramento, New Mexico, and I got to look at that global picture. So that's when all of our partners come together under our mutual aid and we work together as a team. And California is very unique to anywhere west of the Rockies in doing that. So it is a model, uh, but it is struggles for our troops on the ground. It is a lot of work. It, it's always impressed me how you guys do work together. It's almost like, um, Tony, it's almost like a choreography. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you know, the, the California Master Mutual Aid System is second to none in the country, at least based on my experience. We have uh, agencies from all over the state, sometimes out of state, and we're all trained pretty much the same. We all understand the incident command system. A lot of our tactics are, are pretty universal, and we have this common cause. And it's just a really amazing thing to watch everyone kind of focus on this common cause. We're all endure, enduring the same hardships. Uh, but one, that's one of the elements of, of, of this that I really like, is that cooperative nature uh, and working with other agencies. You know, it, it would behoove us here to, to remind people about Ready, Set, Go. And, and basically, in, in a very short, easy to remember sentence, Ready, Set, Go is... Ready, set, you know, prepare your house. In, in other words, weed abatement, things like that. Have a plan. Uh, set is gather up all of your valuables, uh, documents, medications, things that you can't live without. And then go. When you get that order to evacuate, go and enact the plan that you did at Ready. And, you know, a lot of people, they'll stay home and they'll grab their hose and they think they're going to do a lot of good work trying to keep their house from burning down. Let these guys do it. Well, you know what I tell people when, they, when I hear that? Uh, everybody, you know, they, of course, it's shattering experience when you're faced with a wildland fire and the possibility of losing your home. I tell people, though, nothing is more valuable than your life because everything may appear okay and manageable until it's not. When it's not, it's too late. Remember that. Very important. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll be right back after this break. There's so much to talk about with regard to our Southern California wildfires, so we'll be continuing our conversation with these gentlemen on my podcast, What the How? It's available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or just go to whatthehowpodcast.com. Very important uh, half hour we just spent. We learned about uh, all these new aircraft, seven C-130s, 12 uh, CAL FIRE Blackhawks, all being purchased by CAL FIRE and available to us to fight our fires in 2020 or later. And I want to leave everybody with three words. They are... Ready, set, go. See you next week, everybody. Have a good week.